Welcome to Dr. Kiki's story time. I'm Dr. Kiki. How are you on this wonderful Monday? I hope everyone is doing well. I'm here to provide some distraction in the form of historical stories. Yay! Stories are good. Um, I'm tired today. Easter was fun. We had a very nice Easter. I hope others did in your social isolating environments. Maybe you had a physically distanced Easter egg hunt or stayed home and made yourself brunch and Zoomed with your family. That's what we did. We had a Zoom with my family. It was great. Um, yeah, now it's Monday and the sky is blue in Portland. I'm looking out the window. The sky is blue in Portland. The wind is up and so is the pollen. Woohoo! So I've taken some allergy pills and... I'm feeling a little sleepy and sluggish. I should have had another cup of coffee today, but we'll just be sleepy and sluggish. That's how it goes, you know? Are you ready for some stories? Back to San Francisco. All right. As a reminder, I am reading Nowhere Except San Francisco, Memoirs of a Resident Tourist by my grandfather, Tro Harper. These are, this is one of his three books that he wrote about his life in San Francisco as a bookseller, uh, people he met and stories he learned about the wonderful city of San Francisco. I know a bunch of you have been joining me previously as I started these stories last week, and I hope you will continue to join me this week as we adventure through San Francisco's past. Today, we will start on San Francisco's famous Hangtown Fry. Okay. Among the many indignities travelers must suffer is young chefs. Just arrived in San Francisco who have heard of a Hangtown Fry, but haven't the faintest idea how to make one. Hangtown was the original name of Placerville, a motherlode village not inappropriately named. The streets swarmed with miners, coolies, gold seekers, loafers, and the general riffraff that tried to strike it rich without working. Hangtown also had some natives willing to trust the local cooks, hence the birth of the Hangtown Fry. A half-drunk miner staggered, excuse me, a half-drunk miner staggered into the restaurant next to the jail and told the cook he wanted something besides the same old beans and bannock. I want something new and different, he shouted as he slammed his duffel bag on the seat next to him. The stovemeister got out his frying pan, generated some heat, plopped in some bacon fat, and stirred chopped onions into the bubbles winking on the surface. When the onions were about half cooked, he added chopped green bell peppers. Next, the creative chef beat three eggs, a little milk, a half dozen oysters, and into the pan with them. As the new fangled dish firmed up, the chef tested it with his finger and so onto a platter. One bite and his customer oohed and awed with delight. Nowadays, you still find Hangtown Fry on the menus in some of San Francisco's older restaurants. Oh, I need to grab something. Oh, come, oh, ah, see if I can get over here. Hi, we're on live video. I'm just gonna check my Twitter account on my phone to make sure everything's live as I get into this reading and writing. If you can see me, uh, say hi in the chat. Say hello, if you will. So I know you're out there. Oh, I see Stuart Pollock liked this so far. Oh, there you are. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi in the chat. Yeah, thank you for following instructions. Much appreciated. <laughs> hello, everybody. Thank you for saying hello, and um, I'm glad you're here today. Now, on to the story of Izzy Go Gomez. This chapter is titled, If I Threw Some Sawdust on the Floor, Do You Think We Could Call This Upstairs Joint a Dive? Seriously, somebody has a, had a sense of humor. 
One night, not long ago, as I was walking by the huge Ping Yuan house housing project that backs on Pacific Avenue, I thought back to the days when Izzy Gomez, a huge, black-hatted, dark-suited Portuguese with a heart bigger than Golden Gate Park, ran a bar there, upstairs over 848, an address that has been lost forever. As I mused about the sloppy, disre disreputable place and the crazy antics that went on there, with all the characters in town rolling about the shoddy interior like marbles in a bowl, I almost cried. I missed it, no doubt about it. Izzy's was plain. It was dirty and sometimes vile. You could call it a dump and be accurate. But it was a wonderful dump. For 44 years from 1900 to 1944, Izzy Gomez was the most lionized, patronized, and celebrated saloon keeper in the history of our city. At his funeral, the preacher said, He, more than any other, was a link between San Francisco's genuine bohemian days and the post-war present. I don't know why I gave him that accent, but I did. With all that's happened in the past 50 years, it's hard to remember what Izzy's was like and what it meant to its patrons. Still, on nights when the horns in the bay are arguing about the thickness of the fog and the cold wind is trying its best to rip open my top coat, I can think back and see the dim lights with its broken glass shade hanging over the sidewalk, the light that didn't even throw enough illumination to read the sign that said, Isidore Gomez, soft drinks. And I can visualize trying to find my way up the stairs leading to the front door. You had to feel along the walls. You wouldn't have known you were in the right place, except for the din of the customers yammering down at you from the interior upstairs. You were not only in the dark on those stairs, you were lost. When you finally worked your way to the top and pushed open the door, the noise, the swirling colors, the smoke, the jolting sounds from the jukebox, the shrill female laughter, the guttural shouts from the dice players at the end of the bar, all of it hit you full in the middle with the impact of someone trying to knock you off your feet with a shovel. The interior smelled like a zoo. Izzy changed the air twice a year, Christmas and Easter. Having begun as a speakeasy in the days of Prohibition, Izzy's store, as the Irish around town termed, termed a bar in those days, was at best dilap dilapidated, perhaps falling apart. The ceiling was a mass of cracks and broken plaster. The insecure chairs around the oilcloth covered kitchen tables wobbled and sighed when someone so sat in them. The wooden stools along the plain pine bar were braced at every joint with baling wire. The room was a long, narrow loft with scarred pine flooring. There were a few open booths in which a motley collection of jubilance was continually celebrating some birthday or national holiday or whatever other excuse they could think up for having a drink at Izzy's. Over the door to the kitchen was a stuffed fish. If you looked closely at the label on the wooden plaque that framed the fish, you, le you learned it was a bonita. Although the fish was so encrusted with grime and collected nicotine and tar, it could just as easily have been any one of a dozen other varieties. The, lavador the lavatory doors were labeled Adam and Eve. Anyone, drunk or sober, could see at a glance that Izzy had never fallen for the blandishments of a bar equipment salesman. Sales talks about the wonders of chromium and neon fell on a man who had either been temporarily stricken deaf or could only understand Spanish or Portuguese. The windows hadn't been washed in years. The poor, tattered window shades were so rusted at the joints and in the retracting springs inside them, they had become immovable. They hung at odd angles and different levels. There was a stove that could have come to California on a clipper ship, but it was rarely needed since the body heat of the packed humanity kept the temperature at a steady 98.6 degrees. Besides, for some reason or other, possibly because there was no place to hang your belongings, everyone wore the coat or hat he had come in with. The floor was a perfect example of pollution run rampant, checkered as it was with cigarette butts, cellophane wrappers, bottle tops, potato chips, remains of french fries, peanut shells, bits of ice, broken glass, and wetness from spilled drinks. 
Once in a great while, Joe, who was also the cook, made a half-hearted attempt to sweep up, but he soon quit when faced with such an Aug Augian task. On the wall behind the bar was a big mural done in blues and black by some artist who either wanted to earn a credit rating or was paying off an indebtedness. It showed Izzy holding a bottle of beer in one hand and the devil in the other. The devil was jabbing a pitchfork into an elephant's rear end. The elephant stood on his front legs, balancing himself on top of two beer bottles, while on his hind legs reached toward the ce while his hind legs reached toward the ceiling. From the elephant's tusks, a monkey swung happily, a coffee pot percolated on the elephant's tail. A giraffe had its neck wound around with Izzy's right hand like a rubber corkscrew. Over the whole of this meaningless collection of fauna, a nude Salome reclined. On top of the mural, a scroll unfurled to display the message, Awake, my little ones, and fill the cup before life's liquor in its cup be dry. <laughs> the other walls had murals painted by Nils Gren, as well as a motley of faded brown newspaper clippings, some 20 or 30 sketches of Izzy, a lithograph of Franklin D. Roosevelt, a news photograph of Will Rogers, and a clipping repeating the kind of words Walter Winchell had to say about Izzy during a five-minute spot on one of Winchell's coast-to-coast -coast newscasts, which were an American listening habit on Sunday evenings in the 30s. No one went to Izzy's for the decor, however, nor were his prices any lower than anywhere else, unless you figured the endless number of free drinks he bought his customers. You, my friend, have one on me, he would say. Izzy was never self-conscious about his bar. He seemed not to see it as others saw it. Once he asked Neil Hitt, one of his many newspaper boosters, Neil, do you suppose if I threw some sawdust on the floor, we could call this joint a dive? Neil responded, how can you have a dive on the second floor? Izzy shrugged, I guess I like it the way it is. Izzy's joint was not fashionable, although the rich and fashionable turned up from time to time. And Izzy's bar was no fad, since at one location or another, Izzy's was always filled to capacity over a period of 44 years. When Izzy first began his ministrations to the oppressed, oppressed majority, he was located at 436 Pacific, and the Barbary Coast was still pretty much as you can re now read about it in the popular history books. But for one reason or another, Izzy moved around a lot, a habit that annoyed his customers to no end. Izzy solved this problem by having moving parties. In this way, the customers helped him move to the new spot and so could easily find their way on a return visit. Moving parties not only served to overcome the customer's natural inertia, but also introduced them to the new surroundings in a happy, but more often hazy way. Izzy moved into 848 Pacific Street. It was a street before it became an avenue. Sometime in 1930, during the Prohibition years, he mostly served grappa, a flawlessly clear liquor distilled from grapes. It was inexpensive, palatable enough when mixed with ginger ale, and even more flavorful than gin when made up as a fizz. Grappa was powerful stuff, drunk straight and in quantity. It had an inspiring effect on downhearted artists, writers, and itinerant poets. The unfortunate quality of grappa was the feeling it left the imbiber with the following morning. Kidneys felt as though they had been pounded by a professional fi prize fighter, not to mention the space behind the eyes. People who admire in others the skills they can't perform themselves tend to fawn over the objects of their affections. Thus, in a way, Izzy became a patron of the arts. If he wasn't able to paint or draw, at least he could lend encouragement. Between paydays, and there were many of those blank periods between the Great Depression, Izzy fed and watered countless numbers of painters, newsmen, and radio personalities. If a man needed a drink or a meal, all he needed to do was ask. O.O. O. McIntyre, Lucius Beebe, and many other columnists praised him from coast to coast for his largesse. When Walter Winchell mentioned him on his Sunday newscast, he described him as that big hunk of radioactive substance that radiates kindness. You like my radio voice? <laughs> Old school radio voice. Izzy was big all right, so big that not one of his customers had the courage to ask him to step on the scales, lest he break them. So people 
settled for guessing his weight. Anywhere between 250 and 350 pounds? Actually, he was probably around 300 most of his adult life, although he told people that when he ran away barefoot from his native Portugal at the age of 14, he then weighed 250. I never thought of him as fat, however, just majestic. He moved with emotion common to ponderous men, slowly and yet with, with flat-footed agility. Izzy didn't walk up to you. He issued at you like water flooding from under the refrigerator. His shoes padded across the bare floor of his bar with a soft, slipper-like shuffle, making the boards beneath his feet creak with each step. He transported his stomach before him like a cow catcher on an old steam locomotive, and sometimes in crowded moments, used it with the same effect. Izzy was a folk hero. Everyone from Jimmy Rolfe, the mayor of San Francisco, to the president of the Standard Oil Company of California felt they knew him on intimate terms. Ernest Hemingway, long before he won the Nobel Prize for Literature, was a steady customer during his visits to San Francisco. William Soroyan based his play, The Time of Your Life, partly on the action around Izzy's. The great, near great, the would-be types, and the has-beens all climbed the squeaky stairs to share in the laughter and happiness that pervaded the place. No matter how broke a man was, he was welcome. As one fellow said, the only thing Izzy ever turns down is the brim of his hat. People used to argue whether or not Izzy could read. I never figured that out myself, but I do know he spent much time with his account books. He used to study them in the late afternoon as though they had been kept by Egyptian scribes. And well he might, since he once told me he had made over $50,000 during Prohibition, but spent $34,342 on fines. When repeal finally made his effects, his efforts legal, he was so broke he didn't even have the $500 for the license. Thanks to 73 well-wishers and others to whom Izzy's continuance was an absolute necessity, a hat was passed, and the $500 was forthcoming in almost no time. Izzy also lost a substantial amount of money in the stock market crash of 1929, but he was philosophical about it. He said, I was rich once and I wasn't any happier. I think it's best to make yourself rich in friends. His education had consisted of two weeks at the old Washington school, but he dropped out after that saying, if you can't keep two weeks in school in your head, there's no use trying to remember 10 or 12 years. When Izzy ran away from home in Portugal as a boy, he entered the U.S. through Boston on a tramp steamer with no shoes, no money, and no friends. In Boston, there was no welfare office to which he could repair for assistance, nor there was there any such thing as job security, unemployment insurance, or social security. His only social security was his unconquerable spirit. His one great asset was his indomitable attitude. He built his own enterprise zone. As Izzy said, you cannot hit people on the head with a hammer to make them like you. They like me, I like them, we get along. For a time, he worked on a cranberry farm near New Bedford, Massachusetts, but eventually by foot and by freight train, he arrived in San Francisco. Once in the area, he lost no time making up his mind to stay. He went to work in the coal mines that were flourishing in the Diablo foothills of Pittsburgh when, in that, when that town was known as Black Diamond. For a time, after his stint as a miner, he worked as a, a hostler. A hostler? I don't know if I know that one. <laughs> he worked as a hostler in a stable in San Francisco. At length, he went to work at the Union Iron Works, and it was through that hard occupation he inadvertently met his wife. He had only been at Union a very short time when the accident tore ligaments in his when an accident tore ligaments in his back. To recover not only his spirit but also his health, he went to stay at the home of a second cousin, a widow named Amelia Gomez, who lived in Alameda. As Izzy began to recover, Amelia got the idea that Izzy would make a marvelous husband for her daughter, then only 17 years old. 
She pushed this fond notion with a fervor only a mother can summon. But the more Amelia talked, the more enchanted Izzy became with Amelia. She was 20 years his senior. To hear Izzy tell about it in later years, love bit him hard. Amelia and Izzy were married in 1900. Sometimes over coffee at the partitioned off end of the bar that served as his office, he would say, since that time, Amelia has been mother, sweetheart, and friend to me all in one. I have never had serious thought for another woman. Our love has kept us young. I love that. Each time he mentioned Amelia, he would lift the big black fedora hat with the brim turned down all around from his head and tap his temple with his other fingers. Smart. Amelia is smart. Not only that, she is an inspiration. Izzy was a faithful husband. He never spent a night away from home in all his married life. Sometimes this regimen was difficult to implement. Before the Bay Bridge was built, Izzy used to have a taxi driver waiting for him as he closed the bar, so he'd be sure to catch the last ferry boat to Alameda. Among the many phrases credited to Izzy is a remark he made to one of the news scribes who was writing a story about him. Write about me that I admire beautiful women, but I stay married to one. At that same interview, he also delivered himself another quotable quote or two. Be modest. Don't arouse envy. Associate with good people. The introductions of a woman any woman, be she grand dam or trollop, brought a fleeting gesture of his hand to his hat, but mention Amelia and his hat came clear off. Izzy's brushes with the law were frequent and costly over the years. The prohibition agents were after him most of the time and sometimes they actually got him into jail. Most of the time, however, Izzy would merely pay the fine and go back to work. From 1928 to 1933, Izzy was convicted 11 times, but during the period, he didn't spend any hard time in the county's correction system. In January of 1933, he was arrested before he could get the grappa emptied down the sink, and he stood trial before Judge Kerrigan, who promptly fined him $500. But this time, Izzy couldn't scratch up the money, so the judge ordered him into the jailhouse. Izzy's attorney, Fred, Fred McDonald, made an impassioned plea. Yes, your honor, this man dispensed liquor, but this man also dispensed charity and goodwill with his liquor. 90 days, said the judge. But the court didn't understand what kind of turmoil it was setting in motion. It soon found out, it soon found out. So many friends came to visit Izzy they clogged the normal routine of the jail and little work got done. Occasionally, Joe, the cook at the bar, came down and tried to cook for him. It was party, party, party all the time. During his first week, Izzy cooked a meal for all the inmates that he labeled grandly Lobster Newberg a la Bastille chez Isidore. After 30 days of this nonsense, the jailers prevailed on Izzy to take a pauper's oath and so released him. In May of 1936, Izzy had to defend his liquor license or go out of business. The State Board of Equalization sought to revoke his permit on the grounds he had failed to report a shooting that took place in his bar. As the story unfolded, a Mrs. Margaret Lesniewski had entered Izzy's on the night of April 17, 1936, in the company of a man, name unknown. They had sat themselves at one of the tables near the entrance and had proceeded to have a few drinks. At length, the man got up to go to the bathroom, whereupon a couple of not-so-innocent bystanders sat down and engaged Mrs. Lewinsky, Lesniewski in a word or two. An argument started and ended when Mrs. Lesniewski pulled a 25 caliber automatic from her purse and squeezed the trigger. Not being a very good shot, the bullet entered her thigh burying in folds of fat. Izzy explained that this was no matter for the police, since no one but the person with the gun had gotten hurt. The code of the Barbary Coast stated that as long as no one was killed, there was no use bothering the cops. 
The state board polished up its hard nose and hauled Izzy before the hearing board to showcase why his license shouldn't be revoked. Fortunately for Izzy, the hearing officers took a gentler view of the affair and decided not to pull the curtains at 848 Pacific. The officers were no doubt affected by the spirit of the man before them. He didn't really have to explain his philosophy. It was written all over his face. Life is a long road. Take it easy. When you come to a pool on that long road, don't muddy it. Maybe you'll pass that way again and be thirsty. In November of 1940, the grandees of Pebble Beach staged a night for Izzy at the old Hotel Del Monte. In those days, the Del Monte Hotel was the ultimate in watering holes on the West Coast, owned by Del Monte Properties and masterminded by the great-great-grandson of the inventor of the telephone, Samuel F.B. Morse Jr., the Del Monte was certainly the place to stage a party if you were trying to impress the right people. I've always believed the idea for the night did not come from the mind of the proprietor, but rather from the fertile brain of Herb Serwin, who was the public relations man for the Del Monte properties. Like many other such events, it mattered little who actually concocted the scheme. The realization was everything. Some 400 people bought tickets for the party, which was staged in the grand ballroom. Izzy's pixie friends, probably over a few belts at the bar, thought it would not be asking too much of Southern Pacific to provide a seat for a man who weighed 300 pounds. The argument ran that if Izzy sat in a seat and broke the springs, the party would be a bust right from the depot in San Francisco. So they engineered a big overstuffed armchair and arranged with the railroad powers to have it placed in the baggage car. The baggage people kicked it up, uh, kicked up quite a fuss at first, quoting the laws of the Interstate Commerce Commission. But at length, unreason prevailed, and Izzy journeyed to the Monterey Peninsula along with the trunks, boxes, and the afternoon mail, not to mention about 20 or 30 also celebrants who whiled away the miles between San Francisco and the flag stop at Del Monte with copious quantities of grappa. <laughs> it sounds like fun. Hello. The Del Monte management did everything possible to make the ballroom look like Izzy's place on Pacific Street, even to spotting cuspidors among the potted palms and serving grappa fizzes. Though some alchemy they got through some alchemy, they got dispensation from the Monterey Bartenders Union to allow Izzy to pour drinks. A replica of the old pine bar at Izzy's was constructed, but in no way could they hope to duplicate the smell of the original. When it came time for dinner, Izzy naturally sat at the head of the table with his hat on, looking for all the world like a huge gingerbread man without the icing. He demolished his steak and french fries with as much relish as he attacked such vic victuals at his home base. SFB Morse Jr. took one look at Izzy sitting at the head of the table and said, What hath God wrought? At the end of the meal, Izzy was asked to make a speech. He got to his feet and said, This is absolutely the best auto camp I ever stayed at. Thank you. Another of the elfin approaches to humor made by his friends was to bed him down in a room with twin beds tied together, thus enabling him to have enough room during his sleep. He would have none of the overnight routine and took a taxi to the bus station where he got a bus for San Francisco and got home sometime during the dreary morning hours before dawn. As he said at the time, in 40 years, I've never spent a night away from Amelia except when I was in jail. Tonight will be no different. I'm not in jail. I go home. <clears throat> on those lovely irretrievable nights with the jukebox stomping out a Benny Goodman tune, the gang along the bar shouting to make themselves heard over the elbow partners yelling, the dancers jigging about on the peanut shells and the bottle caps, Izzy tiptoeing a Portuguese folk dance with incredible grace despite his massive bulk. There was a spirit of joy that kept the merrymakers laughing and talking until they could laugh and talk no more. Dad Nehemiah, bartender and fill-in cook, used to eye the scene before his bar with a bemused tolerance. This place is a regular Napa and Agnews, all rolled into one. There were invariably some maudlin rummies who believed they were 
as able crooners as Bing Crosby, Russ Colombo, Rudy, Rudy Valet, and Ozzie Nelson all rolled into one. They would entwine arms about each other and try to stay in tune with whatever popular song was on the jukebox. Occasionally, someone would show up with a concertina or a guitar, and then the songs turned to hymns or Irish ballads. One night during World War II, a small squad of Marines found a couple of army flyers wandering around Chinatown, whiling away the time until their ship left for the South Pacific. As often happened in those days, they wound up at Izzy's. The drinking proceeded on an orderly course until one of the Marines decided to sing the Army Air Force song, Marines version, which went, off we go into the wild blue yonder, crash! At which moment, everyone threw his glass on the floor, adding live sound effects to the vocal. The management, after the first crash, prevailed on the happy throng not to sing a second chorus, although the Air Force Flyers loved the act so much, they laughed for 30 minutes. Another time, I was trying to fit a nickel into the jukebox when I turned, to turned around to see a college boy fall straight away from the bar like a frozen rope. The fellow standing next to him had taken offense at something and cracked the lad on the chin with his fist. I never saw anyone in the prize ringer out go down so accurately and coldly. Buckets of ice water plus a few poured beers finally revived him. At a St. Patrick's Day celebration, a leprechaun from Reno <laughs> thought it would be a capital idea to shout, to hell with the Irish! For that indiscretion, a group from the old sod south of Market Street chucked him through the window onto Pacific Street. Then, thinking they had killed him, they ran down the stairs, stuffed his limp body into a car, and drove to Kizar Stadium, where they deposited him among the beans and girders under the seats. In those days, the city didn't protect the premises with a chain link fence. He woke up about five in the morning with the rain dripping in his face, took one look at a faint electric light shining somewhere down in the gloom, and thought he had died and gone to hell. At length, he decided he hadn't gone to hell. He wasn't actually dead until he tried to move. Then he devoutly wished he was. With a broken collarbone, a cracked shin, and a minor concussion, plus the grandfather of all hangovers, he was not well. Finally, he worked his way to the street and caught an early bus to a stop near the emergency hospital at Civic Center. At Izzy's, you almost always ran into some irrational soul who, upon being introduced to the restorative wonders of grappa, would forsake reality and flit about with abandon. There was a woman one night who insisted she was a butterfly. I am a butterfly, she cooed to whoever would listen. Izzy regarded the woman fondly and said, she is having a good time. Everyone here is having a good time. I am a friend of the people. This is how the place is. No gambling, no house gambling, I mean, just a bar. I am at a loss today to categorize all the various drunks who hung out at Izzy's. There were the Carusos, or of course, the singers, never on key, but always right there with plenty of volume. There were the weepers who used to stand at the end of the bar and cry about whatever it is drunks cry about. Dad Nehemiah used to get hopping mad when Izzy would say, you can always tell when dad has had too much to drink. His eyes water. Then there were the firebugs who loved to spill brandy or 100 proof whiskey on the bar and set it alight with a match. Their glee was unconfined as dad tried to slap out the flames with his bar towel. When Izzy first moved into 848 Pacific, there was no plumbing in the place, so they cleaned the glasses in tubs of water hauled up from the bottling works below in buckets. Angelo Cappadonico, the owner of the building and president of the Belfast Sparkling Water Company, finally had plumbing installed in self-defense. It was that or continue to replace the carton supply. When the action in the bar got heavy, Dad and Izzy, washing the glasses in tubs, created minor waves that sloshed over the sides, drained down to the lower level, ruining the stock of corrugated bottle cartons stored in the room directly under the bar. There was an evening when Izzy made a bet with one of the scribes present that he could smoke a cigar in the shower. The bet was made and Izzy repaired to a nearby rooming house where he won the bet by showering with his broad-brimmed fedora still on his head, 
as he puffed on the panatella. His hat, however, was damp for days. <laughs> It seems odd now, looking back, that Izzy took such a tolerant view of his flock. He was always polite and unhurried, even at times of crisis. Today's attention to stress would have left him amazed and amused. Early in 1944, Izzy and the various sorts who hung out regularly in his place decided it was high time they gave Amelia a big party, since it was her birthday. Uh, her birthday was coming up in a few days. That proved to be a good, as good excuse as any. The party was staged at the family cottage in Alameda, a frame dwelling with a veranda and flower garden in front, a victory garden in the back. The house was immaculate, everything painted and polished to shipboard cleanliness. If Izzy kept the sloppiest bar in San Francisco, his wife kept perhaps the neatest house in the East Bay. Much smaller than Izzy and of a lighter complexion, she had preserved herself well for a woman who was almost 90 years old. Her gray hair was drawn back and held by a single comb. She had a challenging yet friendly smile. She dressed for the birthday party in a simple blue print dress with a scarf around her shoulders. By Gomez standards, the party was elegant, but compared to Pacific Street, it was quiet. A quiet, pleasant get-together with about 200 friends, well-wishers, and assorted characters from the Barbary Coast. Dad Nehemiah, the ancient bartender, designed the birthday cake, and it was a sight to behold. The day before the party, Dad went over to the baker, got the cake, and brought it back to the saloon. He set the box down behind the bar and produced the cake for all to see on the bar. Izzy came over to admire it. Dad smiled proudly and said, See, Gomez? It says from Isidore to Amelia. That, that dove there is you. That one over there is your wife. You are bringing her this letter, and when she asks you what it says, you're supposed to say, a happy birthday to you, and may you have many more of them. You are my guiding star above stars. Can you remember that, Gomez? It's original. I thought it up myself. And you know that what those two American flags stand for, don't you? He paused and then blurted, patriotism. You are a good boy, Nehemiah, said Izzy. He slapped the old man's back with a hand the size of a catcher's mitt. Nehemiah then beckoned to Joe the cook. Come here, Joe. Joe shuffled over to take a look. Joe was a wizened little man with a corrugated face. He was once characterized by William Soroyan as a man who looked like a 10-year-old boy but might kill a man with a bottle if he had to. His wife had been in a hospital for 15 years and was not going to get well. But Joe had plodded along, raising five children on his meager pay with no one to help him. Joe never rushed anywhere at any anywhere at any time, but he always seemed to get where he was going on time. So when he turned to look at his cake, at the cake, his face showed no sign of interest. He mer merely said, "Burn nice," and went back to sweeping the floor. The birthday party was only one of a series of fets given for the Gomez, Gomez family, although it was the only one attended by Amelia. When William Soroyan's The Time of Your Life opened in San Francisco, Izzy was invited to sit in one of the down front boxes where he could see and be seen. Honor at an opening of the Ice Follies and was skidded about the rink at Winterland in a big swan boat on runners as he waved to the audience. <laughs> Just after noon on 21 June 1944, Izzy Gomez died of ure uremic poisoning at the age of 68 in Alameda, where he had lived with Amelia for 44 years. Whoever was in charge of the funeral decided to rent all three rooms at the Smiley Gallagher Chapel. It was not enough space. Even with three rooms and 250 chairs, there was nowhere near enough room for the mourners. Had the funeral been held in San Francisco, there would have to have been accommodations to seat 1,000. In the chapel with the casket, there were enough floral tributes to stuff a greenhouse, every kind of flower and wreath from spare no expense pieces to tiny bouquets. The chapel smelled like a perfume factory long before the ladies and their escorts elbowed up to the casket to say goodbye to a man who had provided solace, entertainment, charity, and fun for almost half a century. Reporters, bus drivers, welders, locksmiths, private detectives, and a whole lot more were on hand to say farewell. There was Blackhand Pete, 
Shorty, the ace pistola, Dad Nehemiah with his silver-headed walking stick in his gnarled hand, Joe the cook and general cleaner-upper came with his brother John, the countess knocked off from her job as a burner in a war plant and brought red roses in her arms. There was Johnny Lopes, who used to scold Izzy about 20 times a night for giving away too many free drinks. The Reverend Joseph C. Carpenter of the First Methodist Church of Alameda subbed, summed Izzy up by saying, he was a charitable spirit. Many who are now successfully established will rekind, recall his kind help proffered at opportune times. The down and outer, the temporarily stranded, the one in need, these knew the generosity of his heart. When the funeral broke up, a long cortege followed the hearse to the mountains, Mountain View Cemetery. The whole affair was like burying a period of the history of San Francisco, and it made everyone distinctly aware of their own mortality. Many of those who repaired to a nearby bar after the last words were spoken over the grave sat on their stools morosely, contemplating their sad faces in the mirrors behind the bottles on the bar back. Those who drove home quietly were careful to stop at all the stop signs and obey all the red and green lights. Each one reflected back, remembering special moments with Izzy, thought of the year pa years past. Each one fervently hoped the future could only be half as good. As the crowd eddied singly and by twos from the cemetery, a reporter from the examiner turned to his companion and said, you know, even if Izzy never had much money, he did what you and I think we would do if we had a million dollars. A cab driver just behind him said, it's going to be a lot less like San Francisco with Izzy gone. It sure is. There's an addendum to this chapter. When this story appeared in the Sunday edition of the Examiner Chronicle, a restaurateur named Sam Duval became so interested in Izzy's history, he made up his mind to recreate Izzy's place out on Steiner Street near Lombard in the Marina District. While it lacks the long stairway and the stale odor and discarded drinks and cigarettes, the contemporary Izzy's Steak and Chop House has many of the charms of the original. As a fancier of these New York-style eateries, I often eat there. And that's the end of the chapter for today from my grandfather's book, Nowhere Except San Francisco, Memoirs of a Resident Tourist. Thank you for listening. W. Walker, WW, thank you for enjoying. Joe Carmine, thanks for joining. Everybody who's watching right now and has been listening, I hope you enjoyed this chapter. I thought it was a great story. I love the story of Izzy. He's He seems wonderful. Like he was really the kind of person we can all aspire to being, where it's not about money, it's not about that wealth of your life, because wealth really should be measured in the number of friends that you have. How can you impact somebody's life today? Maybe we all should take a little page out of Izzy's story as we move forward through these difficult times. Yeah, thank you. It was a great story. So I will be back again tomorrow to do another live reading from the next chapter, A Refuge from the Cold and Fog from, um, from the book. Yeah, uh, and this next chapter, hmm, it looks, oh, there's, oh, it's a wine cellar story. And then there's a long chapter about someone named Lily Lum. We'll get into it. Yay. Happy Monday. I hope you're enjoying, well, wherever you are in the world, happy day. Happy day. Let's continue with our days. Um, you can, I guess, contact me through Twitter to, at Dr. Kiki if you want to talk about the book. Um, also, just come back here tomorrow. I'm going to be posting these videos. I have been posting them on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, The Dr. Kiki, if you want to come back and re watch at another time. Um, yeah, let's keep going, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.